been an increase. Um, and we know a few of those. Esti was one of them. And then quite a, I think there was one or two in Saudi, which was great news. Uh, so nice to see that growing. Nice to see that number growing. Um, and yeah, let's, wherever we can help you, we have also started uh, opening up some of the uh, DIY stuff on Udemy. So if you are interested, please reach out and we can um, we we can provide a coupon, which is a lot easier. And Wesley asked, how many masters do we have in South Africa? Wesley, unfortunately, they do not publish regional statistics and they don't give us any idea of who it is. And, and so it's a little bit difficult at this point in time. Um, I personally know of four that uh, so Veronica and I, uh, and then we have um, Yolanda Smith, Esti, and there was one other person that I can't remember the name of. So those, those are the people that are, are in South Africa. So it, it, always remember there's a difference between a CDMP master and then a master level pass in data management fundamentals. Okay. So the, the difference is quite big. You have to get 80% in three. Which is which is not as easy. Okay, ask me. I did it something like five times, uh, all in all, uh, just to get everything done. Um, and and there were some interesting experiments there. Ah, oh, so we see it. Etienne is here. Etienne, greetings. Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, lovely to see everyone. Connie, Paul, nice to see you all. Okay, so. Uh, really nice chat. I wonder how many of you were in the meeting uh, yesterday where we had Accelerate Your Data Value. And it was all about, uh, and I, I liked, there were a few things that I liked. Basically said, this is about data analysis, data analytics, be it BI, be it AI, be it whatever it is. It's about producing data that provides insights uh, to the business and helps the business achieve the, the goals that they are looking for. And what I'm trying to suggest here, and my big area over here is business goals drive data management. So if I don't have a good understanding of the business architecture, okay, then how am I going to really work out where we should be focusing in? And again, we, we should be talking to different stakeholders uh, across the different uh, organizations. Uh, different departments, sorry. And what happens if we don't have a business architecture? What do we do then? Okay, do we interview everybody? We've done that on several occasions where we just go to the six departments, have ideation sessions with them. And we just have to trust that what they're telling us is what they need, which is not a great place to be. Um, I always like going into those meetings, understanding the business, what they what they believe is good value proposition or good value to the stakeholders and so i have an understanding of of that okay so this is what i'm trying to share with you is is what can we and should we get from enterprise architecture slash business architecture and etienne did a lot of that etienne helped me in the Reserve Bank, we, we did a lot of data strategy, but we had to align it to the business strategy and where the SMO felt things were going. Okay, so these, these are important alignment sessions that you need to get right. Okay, so this is BizBoc, which is the business architecture body of knowledge, different to BA BAC, which is the business process body of knowledge or the business analyst. Okay. And business analysts are more focused on delivering business processes. So we hardly even touch business processes here, which is an important point. We focus on who the stakeholders are, what value do we deliver to them. Basically, your business strategy, which tells you the why and the what we need to do. It doesn't tell you the how, which are your business processes. And then, of course, we have our... Uh, DM Bach that we work with every day and we constantly try to improve and do things better. So those, how do we bring these two worlds together? Now, on the week one, we spoke about the manager 
And then we spoke about the manager has the responsibility of making sure that data management is aligned with enterprise architecture, data architecture, software development, solution architecture. They need to understand it, they need to contribute. And please remember that information management or data management is a capability within the business architecture. It tends to be a supporting capability, not strategic or customer facing. So it is a supporting and you will help them by improving your maturity and ensuring that they are doing better in, on, on their side. OK, that was the manager. Now we're focusing on the citizen, the data citizen, which we tend to refer to as those people that use the data in line with the policies and procedures of the land. Basically, they're good citizens. And that may be a data steward, a business data steward. Uh, it may just be an SME that we have within the business or anybody using the data. And here we're going to show a little bit about the industry reference model. So uh, data citizen tends to be a business SME, and I'm going to show you what are those different reference models. Then we will be going on to the professional. So if you are an architect, you want to be able to connect yourself to the business architecture. So you need to know what to ask, what to request, how to align. OK, and then how do you build a data estate, which is in line with the business architecture? Uh, and then how do you make sure that you line up with your data strategy? And then we talk about executives, what is important for them, and it's all about making sure that we're delivering value. OK making sure that the business is benefiting from what we do. We understand the business and we're contributing to that. OK, um, so that was a large part of yesterday's discussion. It was all about value, uh, driving value, driving data value. OK. All right, um, and then we spoke about the question. So what what I'd like to answer for you is and hope you uh, on today's session is well, as a data citizen, why should I care about business management, business architecture and data data management? What why is that important to me? What is my role in business architecture? And then what are the common mistakes of using an industry business model? So I'm going to show you some industry business models, but be careful. Be be careful of these industry models. I've seen uh, organizations adopt an industry model and they basically say this is our enterprise data model and this is how we work and it's like okay but that's not the same as your business architecture so how do we how do we deal with some of those issues that we're facing please if you need to ask a question please put up your hand and, and i'll be happy to pause okay so i'm just going to do a quick uh we did essential concepts last week but let me go through it quickly. Um, what are the essential concepts of business architecture and then the alignment to data management? And, and what I'm really trying to show you here is, is the business architecture thing, and, and then we know how to map it to the data world. OK, so the great thing that we have here is that there you go as part of the core. Information is the core on business architecture. OK, um, so. Surely we should be getting all of our, our entities, our core business objects from the business architecture. And yes, you can. And, and I'm going to show you how and how some of these industry models do that. OK, how many of you were aware that um, this should be available from business architecture? Has anybody got an information model from business architecture in their organizations? So maybe I'd love to ask Mark. I know you've been doing, you're a data architect and you've been working with lots of companies. Um, now, I know that you have oil and gas have these well-defined uh, enterprise data models, but have you ever connected that to a business architecture? Uh, yeah, it's a good point, Howard. In the last two, two, two of my last clients, uh, we both, we did the work to develop the subject area model and then try to tie the, the data objects back to that. So we've mapped the capability. Oh, again, one an oil company and one a pipeline company have gone through the exercise. Okay, nice. I'm trying to map the business to data. By, That's fantastic. By, by, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you've, you've, you've experienced that, and I think, it's, I think you have to learn a lot about the business architecture uh, and understanding it 
And and I think it makes you a better data architect, and it certainly makes you a better data manager, a data professional. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. All right. So always remember. So what I have here is uh, basically the why, what, who, where. It's got to answer all of these questions of within the business, and we know that we would use the Zuckman model. Uh, that has the why, the what, how, where, who, where, and why. And uh, just for a quick prize and a shout out, does anyone know why uh, Zachman goes what, how, where, who, when, and why? Why does he have that re that that ordering? Does anyone know why there's that ordering? Okay. So what you are finding is that this is very practical the most concrete, and this is the most abstract. So he's actually getting more and more abstract when he moves along this path uh, to the why. And the why is the most abstract, and that's where we battle is, why are we doing this? Where do we want, what's the reason for it? Um, and so the, that's the important element over there. Okay, so then we, we build this, we work on our core, and then these ones on the outside, which was, uh, not the fundamental areas, they are things that use the core. They piece the cores together. So products will be uh, there to deliver on value streams that uh, are part of the capabilities and information. So they're almost views on that foundation. Okay. Uh, and then we have uh, the capability map, which is this list. We have the information map and we have the value streams that we build on this. Now, can you see as well, again, data architect, look at this. You've got decisions and events here, okay? So surely your enterprise data warehouse should be getting the fact tables and the decisions that have to have uh, data products on there that come from this area over here, metrics and measures. Wow, surely, surely we should be getting that. So how do we scope our enterprise data warehouse and understand where it is and not refer to our business architecture? These people are the closest to what value needs to be delivered in the organization. Okay, so what's helpful whenever you get the business people saying, okay, I need this dashboard, I need this report out of this decision. Okay, say, so fine, where is it connecting to the value streams, who the customers, who the stakeholders? and you can start getting an understanding of the map that you're building. Okay, so the basic journey, we get inspiration for the business, they understand the competitive environment, they then build strategic objectives, we're going to ideation in terms of how we're going to address this, and we have plans and initiatives that we're going to use to implement. Initiatives, they tend to be described as use cases, Okay, so we, when we build our data strategy use cases, they should be aligned with our business strategy use cases. Please don't go and build the stuff on your own and try to develop all of this thing, all these things on your own. It doesn't work, and people want to be able to see this alignment to the business. Okay, nice thing for our side is now we can start challenging the business to say, but where did you get this? Where is it from? How does it, how does it work out? And I can see we've got Paul Krubler here. Paul, thank you for joining. Um, I, I know that you 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 spend a lot of time in this with Archimate, uh, and I'm sure you understand all of these different areas as well. Okay, so maybe every now and again, I may ask you just to share uh, some of your insights in these different areas. And, and maybe just a quick one to come back to that. Uh, almost what you would have is this would be uh, you would use Archimate and you would represent this in your business architecture model. Would that would that be correct? Oh. <clears throat> yes, yes, exactly. And and as you often say, I, would, I mean, if you get to a place and you need to do a data strategy and they don't have a business strategy, you either say, okay, well, call me when you're done with it. Yeah. Um, or, you know, that's how important it is. Um, as part of the offerings that we do, we, we try to do a good enough version of that so we can continue you're right and it's often right. work that I, I quite enjoy but you're 100 right this is what we spend a lot of time on in many projects fantastic and and i know that that's something you called it envisioning and you basically start and, and you you almost have to build the two models together the two architectures together certainly with your smaller companies that don't have an enterprise architecture department 
you're basically yeah. putting both of them together right yes fantastic thanks paul um okay great so let's move on these this is the meta model for business architecture okay so once again they should be storing this somewhere in in archi or whatever it is and i know paul and i we did a weird thing of being able to look at archi using power bi and to be able to extract this stuff um and what, that was remember that paul uh, i don't know how far you've got or whether you used it um but what mm -hmm. i've done is what i've done as well is i've also basically if you look at this this is the business architecture for a transport industry model okay and if we look at that it's got something like 1886 capabilities guys if you think you're going to keep all of this in your head <laughs> it's not going to work and if you think you're going to visualize it um you you got you're going to have some challenges so you wanting to connect the dots so for example when i click on a capability which is what i must be capable of doing well, how does it link to the information and the different states and the stakeholders and different elements like that? OK, so we always trying to connect the dots um, and there is an agreement definition. So optimizing the network, how do we work in these different areas? And that, of course, then translates back into the capability map. Paul, you may remember something like this when I built the data strategy that was aligning all of these things. And then I can quickly go to information management and see, well, what are the capabilities of information management? There we can see uh, information access and different elements like that. Um, information security, and we can click on any one of them and we'll see the parents as they go up and the, and the information concepts. Uh, currency is that information concept. OK, so not easy to visualize this it gets complicated lots of stuff happen and you want to be able to find a way of narrowing it down and slicing and dicing just some terminology uh the slides will be made available and so uh you you can go through the details then okay principles of architecture it's about business focus the core purpose all decisions all decisions and processes should be aligned uh, all strategies should be aligned. The scope is the entire ecosystem. So it's not just the business side, it's also information management, it's finance, it's marketing, it's all these different areas. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Paul, I'm not too sure how often you go so wide um, uh, and, and you may focus mainly just on what you're getting out on your data models, is that correct? I see your hands up, was there another question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, just a, a few slides back. The Power BI that you showed. Yeah. Um, what, what is the source of that data? Is that? Ah, I'm actually going to show you now. This is BizBoc, okay. and I'm going to show you. Okay. I'm going to show you the different uh, industry data models, and what I'm going to show you as well is that what they do do is they provide you with Excel. Where is my Excel? There you can see. Uh, my transport reference model, and there's my financial service reference model. So there is my Excel for transportation. Um, uh, I've been asked by the port authority in Saifka, TNPA, to help them with a data model. And the very first thing is I've got to understand what this business is all about. OK, so here you can see they've got capability maps. Uh, there's a lot of them. There's 1,886. Uh, what's the value stream? Uh, what's the information map that we've got, the stakeholders, and then this breakdown that I'm going to teach you a little bit about uh, when we get there. Makes sense. OK, so you don't have to go through all of that on your own, uh, and, and you can make use a lot of what's there. OK, so it's iterative. So can you see here? Oh, jeepers, I've got a bad spelling mistake there. <laughs> Organizational shifts. <laughs> OK, not not good. Let's move on swiftly. Um, OK, so the business architecture playbook. How do you build a business architecture? OK, understand the business strategy, then assess the business impact. Where are we going to have the challenges? Architect the business solution, establish initiatives and then deploy the solution. And it looks something like this. There is your playbook. 
Okay, so how do I connect my data to it? Well, my data use cases are going to be working in this area over here, and this is part of the business impact. And you can see here, business objective versus information impact assessment is my core, and I will be have to understand the value streams, I have to understand the capabilities, and I have to be able to report on that area over there. Okay, so my use cases, my data use cases are there. Uh, my data strategy gets linked in there with the architecture. And there you can see the aspect, they call it business driven IT architecture. So there's, there's IT, there's digital, there's data, all of the different areas come into this one over here. And then it's the initiative. So where does my data strategy come out on my use cases? And then it's product deployment, data product deployment that's going to support the business product. All right, so let's go to the data citizen. Okay, now this was a really nice talk from yesterday. Um, where can we get these uh, meta models? Paul, you can get them from the Business Architecture Guild. Do you remember that first book in the very first slide that I showed you? Okay. There's Business Architecture Guild. You can you 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 become a member of that, and you can get that over there. Okay, so this is uh, from the talk yesterday, and if anyone remembers, this is the, basically a summary of the book. And there they say recognize value. First of all, you've got to identify the value. And most people, especially the business, they 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 created a new term. It's called the data value architect. Okay. And I know Mark is quite keen on that, and I'm sure Paul Krubler will enjoy it as well, is because where do we get the value from the organization? And it's over here. This is where we need to focus. This is where our value proposition, that's where it starts. We need to be connected into the right area. Okay. Now, before we go on there, this is basically um Porter Porter developed this model. He he became one of the leaders of business strategy, business uh, definitions, and he created the Porter value chain. Okay, so nice to understand. These are the primary business activities, and these are the support activities. Okay, human resources, technology, information management, procurement, uh, infrastructure, all of these types of things. They support. Uh, and and you can get some competitive advantage, but this is the area that you really want to differentiate yourself in basically the, the operations of the business, okay, the capabilities of the business. All right, so, so you need to understand this Porter model, and you would look for a Porter model that relates to your industry. Now, Porter developed a, a model of the common industry, Inbound logistics, operations, outbound marketing, and customer. So there is a lot of information at the common level. Okay. But it doesn't specialize. He, he doesn't specialize that. And I'm going to show you how all of this develops. Okay. So within the BizBoc, okay, we have a common reference model, a transportation reference model, and a financial service. There are a lot more. There's healthcare. There's member associations like DAMA. They actually have a, a business model for, for associations like us. And then we'll talk about the key topics and uh, some questions and answers. Okay, so the common reference model. What is in the common reference model? First of all, stakeholders. And these are all of your supporting departments that are stakeholders. Um, and you can see here, for example, the accountant, the asset maintainer, asset owner, campaign for marketing, uh, candidate, chief executive office, chief financial office. Fantastic to know the definition of all of these stakeholders and what they are involved with. What are their uh, value streams and what are their value propositions? Okay, and who delivers them? Now there's loads of them. There, there are loads of these different stakeholders. And again, they give it to us all and they've got nice definitions. Everything from a tester to a regulator to a program manager. These are all the things that, that we do. Okay, so what are the common value streams? And here you can see an example of a value stream and these are the value stages. So what are the stages within the value stream 
each one of these are connected to data. OK, and this is also where you start building your data value chain that follows the business value chain. OK, um, now here's some examples. Acquire an asset. OK, uh, something like building a data asset is, is, is appropriate over here. Conduct an audit, create a policy, deliver initiative, uh, initiatives, deliver a meeting, training. All of these things are value value streams and they should achieve a value proposition. So the final result of executing a value stream is the delivery of value to the stakeholder. Now, in this case, we're going to have stake uh, value to internal stakeholders, not external stakeholders. Can you see the difference in the labels here? What type are we, internal or external? OK, so now there's an external to the partner uh, and, and we need to understand that. OK, and how do we document this? OK, so this is how we document a value stream. Paul, I'd, 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 it would be interesting to see how you go about it, but I really like this. It's, it's almost like a use case in UML. Um, so we have the value stream. What are we trying to achieve? What's this value stream trying to achieve? And then uh, the who is it for? OK, and the value proposition over here becomes your major KPI or business ratio, especially when it's delivering to a customer, an external customer. And then you have the steps or the stages within the value stream, like request an audit. Uh, then the description is the act of requesting an audit. What is the criteria, uh, an, an entrance criteria? And what is the exit criteria? What do you have to achieve? So what needs to be ready when you start and what needs to be achieved when you end? And who's the stakeholder? Now, these become what we refer to as minor KPIs. They roll up into the major KPI. And you can use this to detect bottlenecks in the in the stream, right? What's causing me to drop value? OK, so if I'm getting through this one quickly and I have a good success rate, then there's no problem here. But you would pick up on the ones that are taking a long time. You can look at efficiencies. You can look at improvements when you measure it like this. So what it does require sometimes is that you've got some measurement going. Somewhere along the line, you understand what's happening in this value stream and what the, what sort of value are we delivering? OK, does that help? Paul, I'm not sure if you if you go through the documentation of your of your value streams like this. Um, yes, I, I, we have we have done these sort of layers. I think um, I think you were you might have been involved in that one quite a few years ago for Ultron. Yes. Um, in, in in our smaller smaller uh, customers, we we don't we still follow the value chain, but we don't necessarily break it down so much. We just okay. get the gist out, um, and then we normally go with capability, and then and then the data. But this is very important, especially um, especially what we're doing now. For example, Agov, is they're expanding their view to look at the bigger Alan Gray philanthropy group, and right. to get all those KPIs. Uh, stacked up and how they aggregate is is a is a yeah. very interesting exercise. And remember, we at at one stage we did that uh, metrics or the cake layer of metrics, almost rolling down from the top all the way down to the bottom. These things all roll up. Balance scorecard mm. does it. OKR doesn't do it uh, because the balance scorecard takes so long to set up and maintain. Uh, people went for the quicker ratios, but the problem you have with that is. What elements affect this? You know, what are the measurements that affect that roll up into that uh, OKR? You you typically don't see it. OK, so this is what we call the tiering of capabilities, strategic direction setting, customer facing and supporting. OK, these are very important tiers. And what you want to be able to do is build a heat map of how well you're doing on your strategic direction, on your customer facing and your supporting. And those heat maps come from the KPIs. OK, so you'd want to build an understanding of how well are we doing and then drill down into the detail. Where are we going wrong? And that's also part of your maturity assessment that you can that you can build. OK, so there's your uh, common capability map. Now, remember with the Porter model, 
uh, that was the one view of it. You want to develop this for your industry, um, but this would be across all industries. So all industries have this agreements, customers, orders, partners, products. They they all have it, and and you can make use of this common model across all of your diff different areas. Okay, so now you get an information concept which is then broken up into a category. It's not as nice as a subject area model, but they basically say we've got primary and secondary elements. So you can see that there's an agreement and the secondary would be the term of the agreement. That makes sense. So there's your main concept. And then this is almost like an attribute. Uh, yes, it may be an entity, but it's, but it's almost what I like to, <laughs> I use this term called the second class citizen. That typically the business will talk about first class citizens and then they'll mention it later on. They'll mention the second class citizen because there's just too many details that you have getting through all of this. Now, the nice thing about this is you can see the definition. You can see the types. OK, so agreement could be a bilateral, a unilateral, express, implied, executed. Now, I'm just going to pause here to see people like uh, and Veronica, excuse me for using your name, uh, but even me, right? When I come into a new industry, well, what are the concepts? I have no idea. Where do I start? Okay, here we've got a fantastic starting point. Now, if you've been in the industry, certainly like Mark that's been in oil and gas for so long, he knows these things backwards. And I think uh, Mark's uh, industry certification, you need to know about these concepts. Not so, Mark. Almost when you do the exams on, on oil and gas, they're going to talk to you about specific oil and gas concepts and how do you measure it, how do you ensure quality, and, and what are the typical issues that you face in the industry. Okay, so here's a place to go. This is where you want to start. Okay, notice I've got asset intangible. There's my data asset. It's going to come up under intangible assets that you want to be looking at. Okay, now there's loads of them. OK, there's loads of these different things. If you go, if I go to my Power BI model, OK, there's my information model with all of these different areas that we've got. OK, now I think I've got something selected. Mm, I'm not sure what it was, but if we go to the business architecture and we unselect that, um, I've got 64. I've got 64. And now look at this. We've got all of the states, the important business states of that. OK. Where did we use your name? Um, uh, sorry, I actually missed that. But one of the things that Veronica mentioned to me, the, the things that she battled with in data modeling prior to doing Steve Hoberman's courses, you, you sit with this empty page. Where, where do I start? What are the entities? Well, here are the entities. This is where you can go and look for inspiration and understanding. Sorry, I didn't explain that aspect to you. Veronica, does that make sense? So I, I used your name and, and I, I remember that was a question you asked me um, quite some time ago. Uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so here it is. These are all the what's, OK? These, this is your high level business concepts. And we need to know about all of those across the different industries that we're working in. OK, now this is just for common information concepts. OK, so let's now we've got the common model. That's fantastic. Let's go into transportation. OK, so here's my transport industry blueprint. It provides a baseline. It also provides a cross check on existing models against an industry benchmark. This is a very helpful thing to know, especially when you're coming in cold. You want to be able to know how do you compare? Have you got all of the elements that you that you need to have? What's missing? OK, so here is just an example of industry specific value streams on transportation, a route. OK, that's not going to be in common. OK, not many businesses have routes and trips and shipments. OK, tends to be in the logistic area or, or people that set up bus uh, companies that do a route from Cape Town to PE. OK, so they plan a route, they agree the schedule. These are the elements. And what you will find is it's helpful to have have a checkpoint here to say, well, did we plan this properly? What's our starting point and ending point? And can we move on to agree the schedule? OK, 
So there we go. That's what's referred to as a value stream. OK, and there's again, we take the same template that we used and we document it and we can then identify what is the entry criteria, the exit and then the item that is being delivered. So we have a shipping itinerary. We have the carrier has been engaged. We shipping under control of the carrier. The shipping is received at the destination and the shipping is under control of the recipient. OK, very nice. Very nice to have that breakdown of the value stream and you can measure it as to where did the shipping get lost? What happened? Is this the carrier that's not delivering or are our, our itineraries wrong? What what's going wrong? Where do we assess this? OK, so nice thing. We inherit all of these common all of these common ones that we have from the common model we inherit into our transport model. You don't need to do this again. OK, and here this is what it looks like where we take these different tier models and we add the transportation material. If you're shipping material, route management, shipment, trip, network and conveyor. Now I'm hoping you can see that we've now got six out of 15 uh, well, six out of 15 on tier two, but out of all of them, there are a lot that we've saved in this scenario. OK, so you do get a big uplift in, in dealing in something like this. Paul, just your experience. Have you ever gone from uh, across the entire business to map something like this? Or have you been focused pretty much on the industry specific model? Have you have you gone very wide on, on these models? Um, typically, just on for, for the industry specifically, uh, I found a lot of value from this sort of thing when we did work at MedScheme, for example. I could right. go in and um, and and go into the conversations and the meetings with a bit of, as you say, with a bit of. You don't go in there with a blank page. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, uh, you know, the models that I've used in the past is the lens of distance models, which is yes. similar to this. Um, and they, it also starts with a generic, a common. And one, I'm, I'm actually going to share his model. So I'm going to share some okay. of his work that he's done. So that's great. I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned it. But look at these interesting mm. things. For example, decision management. How do we manage decisions? How do we manage events? OK, and of course, there's our information management and competency management uh, and work management. So and, and you will find, for example, on his uh, Paul on his uh, universal model, uh, you know, a lot of the work management and training and competencies came in there. So this yes. tier three was where his uh, volume one came in. A lot of it was there yes. and they related on that. Fantastic. OK, yeah. so we are going to connect the two together. Now, what my problem was is this is great. I've got a transport model, but now I go and look at a port authority model and it's like, oh my goodness, it's completely different. OK, <laughs> now how do I then connect the two? So the port authority, it is transport and it's got to roll up somewhere and I've got to be doing this mapping. OK, uh, in these different areas. OK. So we're going to get there. So that's an example of transportation. Here's financial service. OK, similar thing. What are the unique um, specific to industry? There's a service portfolio, a financial agreement, plan, investment portfolio, transactions, payments. These are the different value streams that you have. Wow, I, I have learned so much by reading these value streams. And then you can go into uh, uh, discussions with the business, understanding it a lot better. So what I would like to share with you is that the citizen, the SME should be helping define this so I can go to a place to read. So I don't need to bug him to say, oh, please explain the business to me. How does the business go and how does it work? OK, I should be able, you should be able to refer to me. So go there, look at it. That's the way we're doing it. OK, and then come back to me if you don't have all of the questions. OK, so once again, Establish an agreement between the customer. Customer or other requester has a new or updated agreement. The stakeholder is a customer or a partner uh, and or because we may have a partner providing that service to the customer. And these two are linked. Notice how these stakeholders change. A risk officer, evaluate the risk. 
uh, agreement, customer service. These are all things that, that are helpful for us to know what we're dealing with. I've gone and inherited a whole lot of common ones. Okay. In on board a partner. So I, I know that I'm going to be dependent on partners. I need to deal with it. Issues. Okay. Where do we when a customer complains? Where do we go? Well, there's an issue management. Fantastic. I need it. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, there's sort of only two on financial services. Okay. So uh, there's a whole lot that we've reduced in there as well. Okay. All right. So uh, key topics from a data citizen's point of view. Find the appropriate industry reference model that will teach you about the industry. But once I've got that, then I've got, I've got a whole lot of mapping that needs to be done from the industry model to my organization. OK, how does it map to my organization? Notice uh, I've been uh, asked to work with the transport, uh, the port authority. Yes, it's in transportation, but it's got nothing. It has bears no real resemblance to that industry model. OK, so how do I add mine to that? OK, and then it comes along with the industry data model, the enterprise data model. How do I connect it to that? That's another challenge that I've got. And I just wanted to share with you uh, what I did was I did an example. I had to go looking and I found a data estate. I, I found a data estate on Esri. Esri has uh, a whole load of geospatial information on the ports. So there's environmentals. There's my subject area model. That's starting to look a whole lot better. OK, but can you see these terms are nothing like these terms? OK, so now I've got to do a map. How do, how do I build these maps and how do I create the, the relationships between the two? OK, not as easy as we think. And and you said it's it's of course there should be nouns that you're picking up on, but you may use a different noun that me a synonym for that and you then can't connect it automatically. OK, so questions and answers. Citizens, why should we care? OK, well, Really, it's a definition of your business. The more you have your business defined, the whole lot easier it is for me to understand and not to get confused about what you're talking about and, and have to constantly pester you. Then you've got a, a, your stakeholders. You've got the value proposition. I can go and understand that. So what is happening to me when I learn about this? This is where I'm becoming business literate. OK, I'm becoming business savvy on your business. OK, and of course, when it relates to ROIs and financial, I'm becoming financial savvy. So the same way which we demand people to be data savvy or data confident or data literate, we should be ourselves uh, sorting ourselves out in terms of business and financial savvy. OK, it's your value stream. It's your you, these are your capabilities and your information model. OK, now I'm going to show you how we map this to our data management goals. Um, that's a, that's an area that you I need your help on. OK, data professionals, how can we use this? Well, we get their definitions. OK, we should align our business entity definitions with their definitions. Uh, and I know that Paul and, and, and Mark, I'm sure you start a data model and then no one's got a proper definition. And then you start having synonyms come up and you say, oh, but you use the word there and you use that word. What's the difference? And now we start fighting as to who's got the right definition. What happens is the data modeler all of a sudden becomes responsible for the business glossary. Oh, that wasn't fair. You put this onto me and, and, and I don't really have the time to, to fight about business definitions. OK, would be nice, would be nice for us to have that. Measurements of the business, KPIs, revenue analytics. Where would I go to find where I can increase the revenue? I should be going to customer facing, customer value propositions and see how I can improve that throughput and that understanding. Improvement in terms of efficiencies. And then, of course, this should be the start of my enterprise data model. It should also be the start of your Data strategy, OK, you should link these two together and I do a lot of those connections. So taking a step back, I really like this um, context diagram that Susan Early put together 
uh, I'm hoping I'm, I'm saying it correctly. And um, I, I was having a discussion with people about, you know, there's been some criticism on the DM Bach to say it's too theoretical. And I'm saying, yeah, I get that. You can see it like that. But it never promised us that we were going to do the how to implement things. It's, gained, it's not going to be about the practical side of it. It's going to be about the principles. It's principle based. And here's one of the things that we need to understand from, a, from an SME. What are my business goals and my business drivers? And how do I get notified as a stakeholder when anything's ready for me or to be that I require to provide input? And then what are the metrics that are going to help me achieve those business goals? So data citizens, you should be making sure that for every practice <laughs> on data quality, metadata, master data, you are introducing those goals that come from your value propositions and strategic objectives. Please don't just leave them there, the same that we got from the DM Bach. Okay, <laughs> what are your outcomes that you want to bring into this environment? Okay, Paul, any comment from your side in that in this? Um, not specifically. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, just, just other, other, other than to say is, um, it's just, it's good to get this because it's so much of what we do to get a project kicked off is just about this sort of, uh, this sort of alignment. Yeah. And, um, and, and I mean, now that you said like this, I, I, especially in the beginning, I mean, we do as much business architecture as data architecture almost, especially in the first few months, six yeah. months even of a, of a longer term relationship. And it's so important. You can't do it without. Otherwise, you'll just be yeah. busy and not provide value. Fantastic. And and the nice thing, Paul, is I don't know about you and, and Mark. Uh, it's it's one thing trying to build a data model and then try to justify to the business why this is correct or, or it's important. The other thing yeah. is <laughs> the other thing is having a real deep discussion about their value propositions, their capability yeah. map, their information map. Now you're no longer defending, but you're now yeah. the one who can ask the questions and, and have those difficult discussions about where they see it at. And then once you've got the agreement, now you've got the alignment and you can start delivering on that and, and get that uh, objective guidance that you that you require. Yeah, and then in some cases, even helping them. Uh, it's it's going to sound arrogant, but it's almost helping them with their voca vocabulary, right? It's, oh, yes. It's, it's, it's oh, yes. in their heads. I mean, they are the, the experts in what they do and uh, they're into their business. Um, but I can think of a, a number of customers. Once you get to this sort of structured way of thinking, you, you start to present uh, a value chain and talk about the basic capabilities or the events. I call it the event master and the party masters. I mean, something that yeah. I set up. It's just, um, it's just. There's so much appreciation then from their point of view talking back to you because um, it's not that you understand. It's not that you really understand the business better. It's just you understand the vocabulary at least, and yeah. the vocabulary that you now have in common just makes the conversation open and easier. Correct. Um, Correct. And in this last month or so, we've we've met with. With, uh, with a potential new customer who, who was quite taken aback, Paul Bolton was there as well, quite taken aback with how we speak because we we actually ignored any technical discussion yeah. about data. This or that in the beginning because it's it's really just not important at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and when when us as data professionals sort of raise to to the business level, I think it's just appreciated um, and and the whole relationship from there is better. Yeah. And if you look at uh, this was a great point that they brought in yesterday about this thing of understanding the the way in which we drew it, you know, it's recognizing the value. Uh, what services do we do? Uh, how do we deal with our people? How we deal with platforms and investment options and then the trust. So it's not about master data, data quality. I mean, they come. But it's starting at the right place, and and it's getting and, and it's, the right starting point. And, and it's in the context of something that's expressed in business terms. It's not yes, a, yes, it's not something Correct. that is just out of context. Yeah. Okay, so that's why you need to now. What are the common mistakes? First of all, 
this blind acceptance of industry models. Um, sure. <clears throat> Don't go away, buy an industry model and then force it into your business. OK, there's, there's going to be some interesting discussions. And I always remember I share people I, I, this started. I started I was doing some work for one of the, the red banks in South Africa and. I brought this party model along and I had lots of finance people there and I said, ah, I'm going to show you the party model. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't long when one of the business guys said, Howard, what are you talking about? What the hell is this party? What has it got to do with our, our procurement people or our vendors or suppliers? What, what are you talking about? And I never forget that was just a wake up call in terms of bringing my terminology that's got nothing to do with the way they speak and then expecting them to accept what I'm saying and respond. OK. OK, you don't need to force your business to change and look like the industry model. There's a problem that we do. Uh, and then if your business looks like the industry model, well, where are you getting competitive advantage? OK, if everything is the same, then really what's left to you is efficiency possibilities. That's what you that's that's probably where you're going to stay, right? Is is being more efficient, okay? Because you you've basically taken a uh, an, a standard version of any any company and you're applying it. What do you get out of that? I can't see you delivering any better value to your customer. Okay. Then there's this gap between business architecture and data architecture, and the terms used in the enterprise data model are not linked to the business model. And Paul, you bring about a very important point there that, and I always ask, why does data management get lumbered with building the business glossary? Why doesn't it come from the business architects? <laughs> why aren't they the ones? And I really feel that because they're not using modeling tools, they don't have the precision that we have in terms of what that definition looks like at the end of the day. Okay. That, that's mm. my high level uh, justification. Paul, you got your hand up? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I was in a conversation with Glenn Silverstein at one of the demo conferences once. Um, and I think it's there where he said, I mean, he's one of the creators of, of a reference yes. model of sorts. And he says even a 60% adoption is really good. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, and I mean, uh, for one of the local insurance companies that we did work for here, um, they they once uh, bought into into the IA model, but so completely that, um, for example, when we wrote services for the for the ESB enterprise services bus, um, for for getting party information back from the bus, the whole thing was implemented. Even even if you know if you needed five fields, all 200 were implemented in the in the in the the rest of the service contract and I, I was I was wanting to ask this was about 15 years ago or so I wonder if and I'm sure it has back then companies were quite enamored with we need to apply this whole thing to our you know we need to change yes um, at least from the architect's point of view they pushed it and the business obviously pushed back but I'm wondering yeah. if that uh, generally Companies have matured a little bit and, and they don't think they need to do this still, right? Or that's still the case you, you, in your experience? So, what you, and, and where we find it interesting there, Paul, is when, when you're looking at data exchange companies, companies that are, are moving messages, and I, mm. I found that in this uh, port authority, they have gone so far in standardizing all the details about the ship, the containers, they need to standardize. So they've got a canonical model that's amazing in terms of the depth and the and the enforcement of it. Because if the ship leaves um, Cape Town and it's going to Dubai with all the cattle there, <laughs> you know, they need to have an understanding of everything that's coming, what's happening, what the situation is, passengers, all of that mm. stuff. Even before it comes into dock, they should be aware of all of the data that they've got there. So those mm. type of of, of uh, data exchange companies, they they go with hell for leather on that sort of scenario. Okay. Okay. Whereas I find uh, and, sense, and right. you know Lloyd's when they ship the data to the 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 
the reporting entities, when they get all their data, they have to go very high on that. Uh, but others, not really. They don't see as much value in adhering to it uh, like like mm. that. Mm. I actually, I remember, uh, you know, Jenny, uh, and and when I mentioned mm. the Accord data model and data standards, she said, we tried it, we hated it, and we threw it away. It cost too much. We got zero out of it. Uh, mm. That was her feeling. And she was pretty savvy when it came to data and, mm. and stuff like that. Mm. Okay, so then this is the problem. I, I battled to do this link, and I just wanted to give you an example. This is, we were talking about Len Silverstone. I've used his in the South African Reserve Bank, where we had to bring in both banking and financial services. Uh, we used his data model, uh, and we set up a lot in the beginning. We got a lot out of it. Um, but I want to show you what he's put together. And you can see this is his volume two, where he talks about data models per industry type. He's done a tremendous amount of work. Then he has generic data or common data. And you can see the common data, object, party, time, event, location. You know, this is common stuff. And then uh, we've got data patterns that he uses. OK, now this is uh, Lean IX has another data model. And it looks something like this. Now we can just see that every single time a somebody introduces a new thing, then we get different terminology coming out, and and now we've got to map this together. So I don't think that you're going to easily find an enterprise data model that lines up to a business architecture uh, information model and you're not going to be going through all of this excessive mapping but you should be able to really get the terms right and then and then go through the process of linking the two together <coughs> so it's not about defining everything from the beginning it's just about the mapping exercise that you need to get involved with all right so that's that's uh for the data citizen um so that, Happy, I, I've just I've gone over a little bit. Um, and are there any questions, any comments or questions that anyone would like to ask? Um, how, well, people are typing there. So uh, I missed the beginning. So we can get access to these meta models if we join the guild. Is that right? Yes. So if I if I take you to here, Paul, this is the BizBoc. Uh, the Business yeah. Architecture Guild, and this is, uh, you know, so that's the place that you. And so then we'll get access to the spreadsheet that uh, as you yes. have. Yes. Okay. So if you look at. And there's a medical at, and there's healthcare in there as well. There is healthcare. Yes. Yeah. So business architecture. Uh, there you go. Common reference model, financial services, government, healthcare, insurance and transportation. Okay. All right, I need the healthcare one. <laughs> yeah, for the next project. So if we it was interesting that, because in 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 med scheme we had to combine um, combine insurance and and yes. healthcare. Yes. Uh, you, you often have to, and like you said, also with the reserve bank, you had to combine yeah. things. Yeah, I mean we we now getting into insurers, so you know, vitality and, and discovery, they are they provide healthcare and insurance products. So so those and things banking. Are, yeah. And uh, are there similar models for telecommunication? Yes, definitely. There's loads of the models. I do have one around. I did it for uh, MTN. Uh, I was asked to do some mapping on that. And so I, I do have that available. Uh, SIDS. Yeah, there's a there's an insurance industry model. There's oh, a yes. telecom industry model. Yes. A retail. There's a retail industry. You just got to look for them. And again, yeah, you yeah. consume the parts that make sense. Um, right. Part of part of the problem with these uh, to 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 add some weight to Howard's comment. You get a you get a bunch of people in the room and they they want to put everything in the kitchen sink, everything yeah. possible in any possible retail. Or any possible transport, or any possible um, yeah. healthcare scenario. So they've got everything and the kitchen sink in there. Uh, don't expect to use it all, but take some inspiration from it, and it'll it'll help you do some gap analysis as well. Yes. So well, the industry model's got X, Y, Z, and you don't have that in your company. 
do you not do X, Y, Z, or you just call it something else? Yeah, and and what what I found interesting, Mark, is is when I worked with one of the banks, and we and they bought the IBM FSDM. Okay, now the the one thing that really said, wow, this is worth it. I mean, because the cost on those things, please don't underestimate the cost. <laughs> The costs are horrendous in terms of what you can pay for them. Len, he, he's at a different level, but IBM, I remember doing the analysis. It was in the region of uh, shucks, something like 15, 16, 18 thousand dollars of the data model. But you're almost paying the same amount for installation, configuration, training. So you need to almost double those those numbers. Okay, so it's not it's not a cheap exercise, but of course you get you get some of the benefits very quickly and you, and you get a better direction. Now the message that I wanted to share was when one of the business people said, "I've never seen that aspect on financial services. We should be doing it." That was to say, "Wow, just that understanding of of elements or concepts that they'd never thought about." was 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 quite important. It was a it was a realization that they had not thought about it, and that was very helpful. Uh, a, a real value add going back to the business. Eric, I saw you you had your video on. Was there a question that you wanted to ask? Uh, half and half, but uh, Mark, you halfway um, answered it already. It was about retail because. I spent the last couple of months in, in retail and uh, it's super fast paced and there's not much patience with IT and data modeling. Right? Yeah. It's contrary to those ships that take some time to get from A to B, <laughs> so you have some time to wait for them to arrive and one bulk, they deliver a lot of value. Retail is quite yeah. the opposite, fast moving and depending on what you do in retail, it could be really uh, tiny margins there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's 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 what I'm seeing. You're right. Um... But but what we what you what you find and and I had a, a really nice experience uh, in in listening to Amazon talking about the uh, one of the models that they produced they they produced those NoSQL databases and they basically had something that um, was they wanted one IO so when someone had a, a query in terms of a book or a product they wanted one IO to go to the database pick up the JSON document and come back to the screen in one I.O. That was that was a scenario. Now, interestingly enough, that uh, after a while, those documents became two or three gigabytes big. <laughs> and and then the interesting thing that happened to them was they had to start splitting up these documents. Take a guess where they went. Oh, master data went there, customer. And so they used the data modeling techniques to to break these uh these documents up then they suffered with the situation where those json queries couldn't go across documents and that's when mark logic they started looking at mark logic that could query a, a, across those documents so yes you you're going to have all sorts of impacts on it but interesting when it comes to the document design it's not as simple as what was on the screen goes into the into the into the document that's a pretty interesting metric. I mean, being an old DBA and benchmark tuner guy for Oracle, a requirement of completing an operation with one IO, that's uh, uh, no, no one's ever given me that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was it was it was an amazing. It was a I you know it's a really nice about attending those conferences. You have people that come from these guys, and you saw what drove the initiative. They were the ones that created those first JSON document databases. Like, never thought about it, never understood the number of joins in the relational database that was killing them. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Eric, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if there's another question there, or, or I, I, but I think you're right. You, you, they do move at a faster pace. They need a lot more visibility and democratization of the data that anyone can see it what's happening in the market what's happening in social networks they 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 are driven across all the different channels um it's it's quite something and uh from my observation it very quickly boils down to um 
management uh, capabilities, management maturity, whether they just keep doing because the business works or what or whether they come to yeah. a certain awareness and then actually start doing things professionally. Um, yeah, right. Slightly off topic, but for me, this is still one of the standard points. Enterprise performance management, there are fantastic frameworks out there, right? Like yes. scorecards and so yes. on. But I've, I've seen them less and less being used, uh, yes. but they are actually of so much value. Uh, wow, from some right. of the clients I see, even those concepts seem too complicated for them already yeah, to yeah. say, no, that, that takes too much time. We don't get the data together. Uh, we right. just manage by financials and talk about it. I was like, yeah. okay, that's pretty disappointing. Yeah, and and there was there was a few people on Medium that have been writing about how OKR is is not succeeding and letting them down, um, and and that was also a because when Paul and I started with Altron, it's all OKR, OKR, and they didn't want to go to Balance Scorecard, and I said the benefit I get out of a Balance Scorecard is I see the whole hierarchy, I see from bottom to top. I can see where these things are linked, whereas OKRs, I'm, I'm just not getting that understanding of how the, the image fits together and, and managing the interdependencies on what on the bottom rolls up to the top. The, you just don't see it. And then you can't work out why this thing is, why we're not reaching that the ratios that we expected. But, it, but it's a mission. Maintaining those scorecards, uh, there's a mission. Um, but it, it teaches you so much about the business. So there's always that challenge of, you know, what have I got to do to get it working? And how agile are we going to do it? All righty. Uh, uh, any other questions, comments, observations? Um, I know there was one person that's asking for some uh, some references. Uh, not sure how to say it. Abduli, uh, Abdullah, Abdullah. <laughs> not sure how to how to pronounce yes, it. Yes, <clears throat> yes, it's me. It's Aisha Abdullahi. So it's an Arabic Abdullahi. name. It's a bit ah, different. fantastic. Yes, Abdullahi. Abdullahi. Yes, yes. Oh. So I work in the telecom uh, industry, and is I was wondering if I can relate this. Uh, yes, not this city. Uh, it's okay. another one. Uh, Damn, so it's oh, yeah. uh, in Somalia, actually. So ah, I was wondering okay. if I can relate this to the to the my practice itself, and if yes. there are any telecom, yeah, telecom based uh, meta models and all the models you mentioned today, that okay. would be so extremely helpful. Won't you won't you send me an email? I I was asked by one of the telecoms to actually show them what's available. Um, what they did with it, I'm not sure, but I I spent quite a bit of time connecting the dots for them. Okay, so we link linked on LinkedIn. So okay, is fantastic. That, I mean, okay, there. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll do that you. for you. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, great. Cheers. Cheers. Pleasure. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ad. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, Thanks, Paul. Paul. Thanks for joining us. Nice to nice to hear. From Thank you. Yeah. Bye.